Our ship had just left Narvik about a month ago, though I can't be sure. Time passes in an inexplicable spiral to further we venture into the Arctic abyss. Hope had been high amongst us, but as darkness looms above every morsel of our beings, it seems to slowly wither us down. Nothing here is explainable, but that's a conclusion we all seem to reach while we pass ancient icebergs in various landscapes none have explored. The only light which shines throughout this destitute and long-forgotten world comes from our lanterns, fueled by our reserves of whale oil that sit encased inside of our ship's back rooms. As you attempt to reach them, the harsh waves jostle you back and forth through our dim hallways. No man goes alone anywhere. Though none will admit it, each of us is paralyzed by fear. Once I had been called to aid our ship's command at our bridge. Attempting to traverse this harrowing environment appears to be nigh impossible. With my own eyes, I watched our navigator stand totally disturbed while his compass twisted in every direction. North, south, west, east. No man-made invention can discern where we've gone. Of course, this revelation must be kept from the men. My fellow officers have followed a vow of silence. As I sit in the canteen amongst our sailors, hearing their drifting candor, guilt sheaths me. Soon their rations will have to be reduced, a change which will stir commotion, no doubt. Our captain fears mutiny above all. Unloyal men have caused many expeditions akin to our own to go adrift. Why we have been sent by our king is unbeknownst to me. Any research that could be gathered here is stark at best. As our ship plows against the ice, our wooden vessel is punctured by riveting holes. When one repair is made, another must soon follow. Wary of this, the captain sends only our most trusted sailors into the unlit depths below. He's confident none will spread word of our dire situation. There are only so many stray boards that could be continually reused before we're forced to order the men to begin chopping up furniture. I've begged the captain to turn back, but he assures me God will see us through. Yet I fear God cannot detect us here. Nobody can. Edvard, a close friend, fears just the same as I that will never escape these frozen seas. In hushed whispers within our ship's corridors, we attempt to devise means of safe passage home. At the onset of his fears, I thought them to be cowardly. But as we stray into nothingness, my horror has eclipsed even his own. Edvard is the only man I pledge my full faith to, who sits as third in command of this expedition, I and fourth. Our families are so intertwined we often spend our Christmases together with our children running about during the festivals we hold. He wants to return to them just as much as I. It may be too late, though. The howling polar winds ruthlessly whirl our sails, sometimes casting us in opposite directions. While the coal we stored is plentiful, it cannot appease our starving stomachs once the rations are gone. What use is warmth when your body begins to crumble before you? I've seen it happen on some of the previous voyages I embarked on. First, the men justify their weakness by dwelling upon the hardships that life among the seas brings, and then the uncanny thoughts ensue, thoughts of which I had already mentioned in the form of mutiny. It's quite reasonable to begin blaming their officers, but soon that condemnation becomes increasingly absurd as their limbs ache with unending pain from malnourishment. Nothing here is ripe for conquest, or even settlement. The glacial lands we drift past appear to have never harbored life, even millenniums ago. While rumors of bountiful jungles and great plains had once held weight, they rapidly dissipate the further we sail. Only sheer horror courses through my body as we continue to vanish into the decrepit shadows. Whatever national fervor motivated us to pursue this endeavor will be our end, surely. If I am to speak out, I risk being outcasted by command which cuts my input out of any decisions that may prove to our survival. The only officer I speak to regarding these bleak matters is Edvard, the sole one who I'm sure of who shares my sentiment. The others are uncertain. While I find myself teetering upon the possibility of inspiring a coup d'etat against our captain, returning home a mutineer is not an option. 
regardless of saving my life. It'd surely leave my family in ruin. Execution or banishment would be my choice. I could never bring myself to leave my homeland. The disgrace scarring my soul would only signal divine punishment, a punishment likely deserved. If I am to perish here, I'll at least rot a man intact with his honor. It's the sole thing we have control of in this form of the underworld we find ourselves shackled to. Once, when we first began to lose track of where we were amongst our collection of maps, we attempted to drop anchor. As our men adorned in their woolen blue coats and black caps heaved our titanic anchor into the Arctic Sea below, it found no ground. Our chains must have been longer than what could be wrapped around our ship ten times over. While it's unlikely we'd find an ample floor to berth at, I took it as our only hope of safety before we drifted further astray. If we had anchored just then, we could have potentially found our location. That proposition alone, though, is shaky at best. Suddenly, a loud knock is heard at my cabin's door, breaking me from my brooding. I sit on my bed, which is fluttered with numerous charts and reports. Aside from me at a dainty end table is my only source of light, my beloved lamp. It has lasted me many a voyage, yet none was as perilous as this one. Quickly, I don my bicorn which dwindles in the air atop the bedpost, and with great fatigue, I slide into my coat. Captain Dahlberg is called to command meeting, sir, the young muffled voice says. As I tighten my woolen beige scarf around my neck, I tell him, I'll be there shortly. Not to intrude, sir, but he requests your presence immediately, the voice continues, still close to the door. I open the door to be greeted by Nicholas, one of our ship's petty officers. He's one of the men who have confided their fears with me. I've never met a more respectable young sailor than he. Many officers wouldn't tolerate such weakness from a low rank confiding their worries, but I've taken a liking to the boy. His points are frighteningly close to my own. It makes me wonder if the men know more of our condition than previously expected. He smiles and says, Another day, isn't it? We haven't seen sunlight in weeks. More like another night, I remark nodding to him as I trek down the cavernous corridor. Lamps mounted next to each door throughout the hallway fight to keep their flame. My boots sharply hit the polished wood beneath me with each stride. I reach the canteen, laden with tables lit by hanging lanterns. Crates and barrels scatter the room. Just as I see the stairwell leading to the outside world of dreadful darkness, an odd sight befalls me. Men gather silently in a circle though some whispering echoes throughout the room. I move through the crowd and reach the middle of this spectacle. Crouched onto the ground is Edvard. Next to him lies our ship smut, motionless. What has happened? I blare, hoping the pooch is just hurt. I, I received word from the men that he had begun convulsing during their mess night, Edvard says, distraught as he pets the dog's fur, its mouth covered in blood. Nicholas, who followed behind me, joins the growing crowd. I glance at the men surrounding us. It was not more than a year old. Such a shame, Edvard says as he stands, wiping his trousers off. Very well, men. Back to your duties, he says as he looks at the crowd. Someone dispose of the corpse overboard. Wrap him in cloth. He deserves that at least, I say dejectedly as I resume to the stairwell. Edvard and I look at each other bracing ourselves before opening the hatch. Upon stepping out, our bodies are immediately hit with a burning gust of icy gale. Our men trudge along the decks in their tattered indigo overcoats trailing the planks behind them. They know not of our dire situation. Each man walks with a glimmer of hope teeming from their eyes. Once extinguished, there's no telling what will transpire. Outright mutiny is never immediate but slowly the seeds of sedition will be thoroughly ingrained within their freezing bodies if our situation continues to worsen. Surrounding us are vague silhouettes of great icebergs, each slowly passing as our ship continues in the dead, ceaseless night. When I had first joined the fleet as a mere boy, I dreamed of staking flags in tropical islands and exploring blue seas, not the unknown world devoid of life we find ourselves lost in. The vessel cannot take much more of this, Already in my mind, we're too engulfed in the cold void to save. No amount of prayer or hope will rescue us from starvation once our rations deplete. We climb up the frosted stairs leading to the bridge. 
my eyebrows burning in the numbing breeze. I move ahead and open the door for Edvard, beckoning him in first. The doorknob I clench sticks to my glove. I follow behind him. Inside sits every officer amongst the expedition, each with a fearful expression upon their face. They surround a pristine long table. Atop it lies a map spanned across. If any was requested to dock where our ship sails, they'd find themselves hopelessly unable. Empty bunks follow the perimeter of the room. Positioned at the end of the table is Captain Dahlberg, sucking on his pipe while enshrouded in a black haze. It's about time. Be seated, men, he blares. We had an issue in the canteen, Captain, Edvard says miserably while taking his seat adjacent to mine. Captain Dahlberg lingers his gaze upon him and pauses. Well, out with it, he barks. The gathered officers all watch him, all of whom don their frock coats and bicorns. Edvard's face twitches. The mutt died. Apparently it had some form of seizure, he says. A bad omen, Dahlberg mutters while he peers around the room. He was disposed of, yes? I had the men drape and toss him overboard, I say, adjusting myself, scanning around the table. I see only nervous fidgeting. Good enough, he remarks, puffing his pipe. As long as morale remains high, we have nothing to worry of. Morale is, I mutter, before being interrupted. Morale is tarnished, Edvard says bluntly. Each skittish officer turns their head toward him, utterly mortified at what he had just said. You heard me, he continues. We'll all perish if we venture further. We may be unsavable already. Dahlberg's face stiffens. He sets his pipe onto the table. The room rocks as our ship crosses further into our polar graves. Our king himself had set us upon this journey, and you suppose we turn back now? Anger contorts his creased face. There are no lush plains upon our horizon. The seas we find ourselves adrift are wrought with the deafening silence. We are all dead men, Edvard exclaims. The meeting goes silent. Treacherous waves can be heard knocking against our keel. Hanging above us, the lamp goes dim, slowly coming back ablaze. What he had said is the truth I imagine many have been considering. Edvard and I cannot simply be fantasizing about this utter danger our expedition trails towards. Captain, we've accomplished our duties. Nothing here is left for us, Commander Franson gently says, attempting to ease the situation. Captain Dahlberg surveys our wary faces. After a long silence, it appears the brute begins to realize we're all opposed to his lunacy. You've made your point, he pauses. Under the king's orders, the diving suit must still be studied nonetheless before we embark home. He picks back up his pipe taking a long drag. That outlandish invention will surely bring the demise of one of our men. It's a death warrant signed by Hubris. If I were in command of this ship, I'd toss the freakish gadget overboard and blame it upon the rough seas. We may have the authority to question our captain's arbitrary decisions, but not the king's prerogative. As we all glance around the room, each man seems to bear silent agreement to this wicked experiment. If one death is what it takes to retreat from these abandoned seas, I shall warrant it, even if we're too lost to save. As we adjourned Congress, our officers quickly strafe down the frozen stairs, spreading word to assemble upon the decks. Standing aside Franson and Edvard, I stare off across the terrifying lingering blackness. Men begin forming a square ahead of us unaware of the horrific spectacle set to take place. As Captain Dahlberg arrives in formal dress, two men appear out of the hatch, dragging the nightmarish abomination towards us. I'm filled with fear as it looms closer. Holding in their hands is a brownish sack, fitted with twisting tubes upon a bronze chest piece. Atop it crowns a helmet of bizarre proportions, filled with small portholes as if it were designed to mimic a spider's many eyes. Dragging alongside it are its heavy boots, having the same material as both the helmet and chest piece. The men unsheath their faces from their thick scarves, each bearing a frightened expression at the awful sight. On this day, a Swede shall be the first to conquer these untamable waters, men, for after this observation of the deep seas we will move to return home. 
and be amongst the greatest explorationists of all time, Captain Dalberg yells cheerily, masking his panic. The men stand in pure despair. Turning back, their suspicions had all but been proven by Dalberg's grandiose speech. We are lost, in desperate need of saving. How far adrift we sail is unknown, though it remains unspoken, that notion is now obvious. What had veiled Dahlberg's leadership from mutiny appears to have been ripped raw. My head is destined among the chopping block, along with the rest of the officers. They may not reckon it, but the men have deduced our situation. An attempt to retreat from this icy hellscape will only signal the beginning of our demise. Still, it's our only viable course of action. Dahlberg peers into the crowd. I shall have one man chosen to delve into the world below, he says. His eyes wander before setting his sight on one alone. My heart races as Nicholas steps forward upon seeing his captain's eyes locked with his own. Not him, I blurt without thought. Dahlberg shoots a glance at me, his brows furled. Why is this? he echoes as Nicholas trembles, still standing ahead of the other men. For a moment I attempt to think as my mind hurriedly bolts. An officer of the King's Navy should be sent in the stead of an inexperienced seaman. I pause and continue. It is only proper our crown is represented in this new domain by a ranking figure. Captain Dalberg grins and blares. Then who do you suppose we send amongst our officers' class into these waters? Myself. Every man breaks their formation, turning their heads at me astonished. Edvard looks at me as if I'm unhinged. Melancholy winds continue whisking through us. This expedition is doomed, including myself, whether I perish aboard here fending off mutineers or down in the watery depths below. I had said before I intend to die a man intact with my honor. Defending a captain who is responsible for our ruination isn't at all a valorous pursuit. Now is my time. After much anticipation, the captain finally speaks. Unemotionally, he says, prepare the suit. Nicholas steps back into formation. A seaman holds the dreadful ensemble while another unties various tightened openings along its back. I slip my boots off and give my cap to Edvard, who gives me a final saddened look before stepping back. The two seamen whisk the suit open as I step inside, its figure swallowing me whole. While the vile armor of evil is fastened, my every gasp of air echoes throughout the silent crypt I'm to be permanently inside for all of eternity. My eyes peer throughout the cascade of glassed holes my head sits inside. As the suit weighs down upon my weakened bones, I'm walked to a bench that dangles from hefty ropes attached to our mast. Franson orders three others to lift me over the ship's side. Without delay, I'm seated with both of my stubbed gloves clinging to the ropes. The bench sways in the cool air. The men, who still stand in their square formation, all watch from a distance as I'm slowly lowered into the chasms of the polar seas. Nicholas's eyes meet my own just before I disappear. Unable to look up or down, I faintly hear the tiresome grunts of men continue as I'm hauled into the black ocean of terror. My boots hit the icy water first, and I'm soon submerged by an all-encompassing forsaken realm of absolute darkness. While I descend further into the seas, my body departs from mankind. I know now I was not meant to survive this expedition. My family, who inhabits a forevermore far-flung world, will remain unseen by my person until the end of their days. All I could wish for is that my sons do not develop a taste for exploration. This place does not want to be found. No land can be claimed here. Only your soul. Suddenly a distant low humming is heard. From the shadowy waters my vision can foresee lurks a luminous figure slowly emerging toward me. Its black tentacled body sits within a shell contoured as an iceberg. What horrors have unleashed upon me? As I frantically scream, it ejects out of its icy shell and rapidly shoots toward me. I hoist myself to stand upon the bench, tugging the rope as hard as I can. The creature continues its pursuit. Its eyeless torso opens its ravenous mouth, lacking any teeth. Just as I feel the bench being lifted, the sole rope I clutch snaps, causing me to fall into the fathomless void. A swath of my face explodes, the pressure unbearable. 
my blood had spattered upon the numerous eyes within my helmet. I continued to fall, my screaming deafening. The unnatural primordial apparition grasps me with one of its vast tentacles. Before being totally vacuumed into obscurity, my mind thinks one last thought. Sweden. Sounds of waves breaking upon a shore are heard. I begin gasping for air, still within the cumbersome suit. An agonizing sensation swells across my face. Seeing out of only one drooped eye, I find myself lying atop a coast of sand. I grab the ground, pulling my torso up to glimpse where I am. Bamboo-ridden forests and squawking birds are seen far ahead. As I turn to my right, I'm utterly shocked. A crowd of foreign men donning cornical straw hats aim their javelins at me, all shuddering with terror. They speak in a tongue I cannot understand. I realize what is about to happen. My body pulsates with fear. When I attempt to plead for my life, only a horrific sentence spoken in a monstrously raspy voice manages to escape my broken jaws. Do not venture north of Narvik. 